News feeds are tough to digest sometimes, especially when you're talking about devastation like we saw with Hurricane Ian in Southwest Florida. But we're not here to talk about problems. We're here to highlight solutions. A category four hurricane just blew through here. 
and our recovery, literally, we we're up and running the next day. Does a hurricane-proof neighborhood exist? It seems like it, and we'll take a look at how it works and find out if it's something that other communities can replicate a little later. I will fight to make sure that every woman in Texas can make her own decisions. This is all because of Joe Biden's failure. She was forcing the vaccine on people. We made quick decisions to save lives. And there seems to be so much of this. Dr. Oz can't possibly understand what that is like. You know, he has 10 gigantic mansions. John Fetterman brings up houses. The irony is he didn't pay for his own house. It's hard to escape politics these days. And as we all know, things can get ugly fast between candidates. You think you're going to be running against them. I can see how you might get confused, but you're running for governor. The only worn out old donkey I'm looking to put out to pasture is Charlie Chris. But what about when the hostility permeates conversations with friends and family? What should we do then? People I don't agree with politically in my family, I now understand where they're coming from more, um, especially during election time. Our Solutionaries team found out answers on how to manage this delicate situation. That's coming up soon. Hey everyone, welcome to Solutionaries, our show focused on providing answers instead of problems. We're running the gamut today with lots of solutions for a lot of different topics. Today we start with a story that sounds like something out of a science fiction book, but it's very real and unnerving. It is a rare condition, but it's killing people within days. We're talking about brain-eating amoebas. They live in almost any body of fresh water, including swimming pools. There is a movement to get new tests and life-saving drugs into the hands of doctors around the country. Our solutionaries start right here in Florida. It's a microscopic organism that quickly destroys brain tissue and can kill in just days. So I'm surprised that the, there is now more of these tests done um, regionally in different parts of the U.S. Time is of the essence. It's like you having an airbag. Well, I don't need an airbag. I've never used an airbag. Well, when you get in a car accident, you're going to need that airbag. At this point, if you can get a result in five hours when we have to wait 24 hours every day, it's amazing. In August of 2016, 16-year-old Sebastian De Leon and his family traveled from South Florida. I took a nap in the car. To start what was supposed to be a fun vacation at Orlando's theme parks. On Sunday, we were planning on having a pool day and watching the game mm -hmm. and spend it with our family. And um, he woke up in the middle of the night complaining that he had a headache and it was strong. I was on my side and at that moment it felt like I was getting pushed into like the pillow. And then when I woke up, I just couldn't move. My body felt stiff. And that's when I told my mom, mom, like this is not normal. So I just woke up, woke up my husband and told him, listen, we have to go to the emergency or the emergency room because this is not looking good. They asked me had I been in uh, fresh water. Uh, and that's when I told him that, yeah, I had. Doctors immediately suspected that Sebastian may have contracted Naglaria phalari, better known as the brain-eating amoeba, by swimming in a summer camp pond. It's a microscopic organism that quickly destroys brain tissue and can kill in just days. Tell me about the moment they came out and told you what it was. I still remember it, but at that moment, I felt like time stopped. The next words were, uh, I want you to say your goodbyes, because we're gonna put him in a, in a coma, and, and we don't know if he's gonna wake up. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says this deadly amoeba can be found in any body of fresh water. It can infect humans if they get that water up their nose. Most reported infections happen in southern states where the climate is usually warmer, with most reported in Florida and Texas. But cases have also started to emerge as you move north, in states like Virginia, and as far as Minnesota. 
It's a rare disease, right. um, and so you don't see it very often. So we have two buildings. This building is used for manufacturing, um, uh, all the manufacturing we have. Todd McLaughlin is the CEO of Profounda Pharmaceuticals in Orlando. So this, this is a lab where we do our quality testing. Aside from creating their own brand of healthcare products. This actually is the, the, the batch that just came in of the new Infovito. Profounda is also the only U.S. distributor of Impavito. Sebastian was the first patient ever to receive miltefacine or Impavito while still conscious. The only drug there's the pill that kills this amoeba. We got the call. Uh, I got the call um, from first from the from the hospital. Then I got a call from the Florida Department of Health, and then I got a call from the CDC, all within the span of about two hours. Uh, we heard about it, and my son uh, immediately hopped in the car in his pajamas um, and because he didn't want to waste time and got the drug and drove it directly to the hospital and uh, within you know 20 minutes he was at the hospital with the drug and that really I think is what helped uh, Sebastian. Sebastian became one of only four people to survive the brain-eating amoeba in the United States. He worked through months of physical therapy to relearn how to walk and even tie his shoes again. So how much is it? It's about it's about forty eight thousand dollars for the for the treatment for the month, for for a thirty day supply. For the twenty eight day supply, correct. But McLaughlin says patients will never pay more than a hundred dollars. Despite that, and the fact that every minute counts when someone is infected, very few hospitals have Impavito in stock. So why don't more hospitals just keep this on hand as a preventative? So I'm going to answer that question a different way. Is why do people keep it on hand? And the answer is because they've seen a case of it before. So they have cases so they can see it. Whereas, well, I've never seen that before, so therefore I don't need it. It's like you having an airbag. Well, I don't need an airbag. I've never used an airbag. Well, when you get in a car accident, you're going to need that airbag. He was a handful, but he was our handful. He was very outgoing. He made friends very easily. Jordan Smelski's father, Stephen, believes his 11-year-old contracted this amoeba while swimming in hot springs during a family vacation to Costa Rica. Saturday, he, he, he got sluggish in the afternoon. He started vomiting at like midnight on Saturday. We took him to the emergency room on Sunday, diagnosed him with viral meningitis. They admitted him to Children's. And Monday, he woke up, he actually, we thought he was going to be okay because he was in good spirits on Monday. It's like God gives you those last few hours and you don't even know. We ordered the drug from the CDC and it arrived at 8 a.m. That was Wednesday morning. He died at 6.30 that morning. We found out Jordan was the fifth child that died from this at his hospital. And we realized if we didn't step up, the sixth child would end up with the same thing and the same issues that we went through, those parents would go through too. Thank you for coming to the second uh, PAM Summit. Uh, my name is Steve Smelsky. My wife Shelly and I would like to welcome you all here. Stephen and Shelly Smelsky created the Jordan Smelsky Foundation for Amoeba for Awareness. And they started annual Amoeba Summits featuring top doctors in the field. And we shared information. And the next boy that came into the hospital was Sebastian De Leon, and he lived. Hey, guys. Hi, Sebastian. This is Hello. <laughs> My name is uh, Dr. Jose Alexander. I'm a medical microbiology and medical director for the microbiology department in Advent Health. After treating both Jordan and Sebastian, doctors at Advent Health were concerned that the test to detect this deadly amoeba was taking too long to get results back. So Dr. Alexander and his team took it upon themselves to come up with a faster solution. In the instrument, we are able to put the cartridge. We have a capability to put six in each side of the, of the instrument. Their tool, a PCR test, made more widely available during the COVID pandemic. It trims a wait time of nearly a week down to just hours. And I say it's just putting together the recipe in the right way. So I'm surprised that the, there is no more of this test done um, regionally in different parts of the U.S. And you're hoping other hospitals sort of latch onto this and, and use it, right? Yes. This is a game changer, and if every hospital has the test available, they can check it themselves without sending the sample of uh, CSF to the CDC in Atlanta. Time is of the essence at this point. If you can get a result in five, in five hours when we had to wait 24 hours every day, 
it's amazing. The, the care that they took of my child, it wasn't, he wasn't an experiment. He was a human being being treated. And they were looking for solutions. They got involved in a human way, because we're human. But I am eternally grateful. Category four, Hurricane Ian lashed Southwest Florida in September with deadly winds, storm surges, and flooding. It could be Florida's costliest hurricane with damage estimates nearing $100 billion. As the rest of the area tries to recover, one town did particularly well. Not only did it just have minor damage, Residents there weathered the storm with electricity, running water, even TV and internet. Solutions from Southwest Florida. At no time during the storm did I ever feel like we were at risk. I mean, it felt sturdy the entire time. Category four hurricane just blew through here. And our recovery, literally, we were up and running the next day an example of how we should build future communities. Hurricane Ian collided with Southwest Florida. This monster hitting the coastline with sustained winds of 150 miles an hour. The powerful Category 4 storm would kill more than 100 Floridians. The aftermath, unbelievable, leaving nearly three million people without power in a wake of tens of billions of dollars in damage. While no two places down here are alike, one town surrounded by destruction seems to have fared better in the storm than anywhere else. Hey, I'm Vic. I'm Daryl. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We met the Treese family at their home in so, Babcock uh, Ranch. It's a community about 20 miles northeast of Fort Myers. Ian came right through here. I mean, you could hear the wind. You could definitely hear when things were hitting the house. Um, but I will say that at no time during the storm did I ever feel like we were at risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, it felt sturdy the entire time. And. Did you have power? We did have power. AC? We had AC. Um, <laughs> he was working. With six people under this roof and Winston the dog, school administrator Shannon Treese says they watched live weather forecasts, cooked dinner, even worked remote as neighboring communities were torn apart. Meanwhile, the Treeses only lost a few shingles and screens on their patio. All around you, people have a very different scenario. Yes, they do. It was heartbreaking. I'm not going to lie. It was hard. Um, I'm going to get a little emotional probably because my, a lot of my staff, a lot of our staff at Babcock um, live outside of here to see the devastation outside and start getting the phone calls from them that, you know, my house is flooded. My house is gone. You know, I went to my house and I just walked away from it. Um, my house had four foot of water. Um, all of those um, started happening really quickly after the storm. So we started really understanding at that point how fortunate we were um, to be here. And we, did, we have not taken that for granted. We have been all over Southwest Florida reporting on the damage, looking at the hardest hit areas which surround us. But here in Babcock Ranch, it looks like nothing ever happened. For full transparency, it's October the 11th. It's been less than two weeks since Hurricane Ian came through as a Category 4. And everything looks picture perfect. Doing this well in that big of a storm was no accident. It was part of Sid Kitson's decades-long plan. When I look at uh, what happened over the last couple of weeks, my heart breaks, just breaks for so many people, you know, uh, uh, here in Southwest Florida. The destruction, the misery, that you see is just unimaginable. We have, we have ho uh, our own employees who have lost their homes and lost so many of their belongings. At the same time, you know, we, we at Babcock Ranch hopefully can give people hope. And the hope is that it can be done right. And the, all the people, the planners, the engineers, all the people that came together to make this possible at Babcock Ranch should be proud. 
Kitten is a former NFL player who later became an eco-conscious developer, purchasing nearly 100,000 acres in Charlotte County. Most of that is now a nature preserve, but on 18,000 acres, he designed what he calls the country's first solar-powered, storm-resistant town. So you have a property that is eco-friendly. It's now storm-tested. How do you keep it affordable? when the price of building is just skyrocketing. And, and I think there are a couple ways to look at that. Uh, if you look at Babcock Ranch today, a category four hurricane just blew through here. And our recovery, literally, we we're up and running the next day. And most of what we were doing is maybe replacing a few house shingles here and there, some signage. Obviously, to power an entire town, you're gonna need more than just a couple solar panels on roofs. You're gonna need this, a solar farm. Yes, this is a couple miles from the center of Babcock Ranch. It's 900 acres of land with nearly 700,000 solar panels. He teamed up with utility company Florida Power and Light, harnessing the sun to generate 150 megawatts. It's a test site of sorts. Battery backups for cloudy days still attached to the grid. But FPL says it was the underground infrastructure that kept everything working during the hurricane. In this town, you'll find no power lines. Those are often the first to go during a storm. Do you want this to be the national model? Yes, but you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about what we can do in this country. They released the plans in 2005, started construction on Earth Day in 2016. Babcock's team of scientists, engineers, and builders had a tough task when they designed the town, making a community less vulnerable to major storms. So Kitson chose land that was 30 feet above sea level, invested in stormwater drains everywhere, and built ponds to catch the water. The trees and shrubs here, native to Florida, so the ecosystem is naturally fitted for the weather. Every structure is built above code. I do believe that there are going to be others out there that uh, are going to look at Babcock Ranch and say, we can do it better. And I'm okay with that. You're good with that. I'm absolutely good with that. This neighborhood of 5,000 is on pace to reach 50,000 within the next few years. Homes here are selling between $200,000 and into the millions. As Kitson adds townhomes, apartments, and rentals to make it more attainable. All things considered, you did incredibly well. We did incredibly well. Back at the Trees house, things are normal. School is in session, homework is still due. But the family is now spending their free time volunteering in surrounding areas where people weren't so fortunate. Is this the national example? I think it's a pretty incredible example. An example of how we should build future communities for a better relationship with Mother Earth. These killers that are out there, if they're intent on killing as they are, they have found multiple ways to get a hold of weapons and cause mass destruction. How long will you watch people being gunned down in first grade, fourth grade, high school, college, church, synagogue, a grocery store, a movie theater, a mall, and a nightclub, Congresswoman. and do nothing? It's a powder keg. I got a real simple one. This is a yes or no. We'll move right on. Is Donald Trump a great president? I worked closely with him on a, a yes number or no. Of Politics is a tough topic to talk about, and many choose not to. But what if it's not your choice, and the person talking is a loved one with a different opinion? Well, there's going to be that one relative that gets a kick out of kind of pushing buttons. We found out solutions for you. How to navigate tricky conversations like these, next. Facts have never been more important than now. They can be the difference between life and death. Rely on the Trust Index, your first line of defense against disinformation. Just look for the seal. It's true means it passed the test, and we can back it up. Not true means it's fake. Don't trust it. And be careful means not entirely right or wrong, but it could be risky. In the battle against disinformation, no fact is off the table. If it seems suspicious, send it to us and we'll get answers. Look for the Trust Index on the stations and websites 
websites of Graham Media Group. Welcome back. Sociologists call it the perfect storm. A divisive election cycle will end just in time for the holiday season. It can be tricky navigating political debates at the dinner table for Thanksgiving. You may come to learn a loved one's political beliefs have radically changed. Experts say there are things you can do to keep calm and enjoy the holidays with your extended family. You are not going to change anyone's mind in this conversation. So why even expend the energy in this setting of getting yourself upset in an attempt to do so? You are not going to change your mind. If this is who my brother is, then what does that make me? If you feel like maybe one of your family members is saying something dangerous, pull them upside. Don't embarrass them in front of everyone. My cousins were starting to believe in some crazy conspiracy theories that I thought were were harmful. Those concerns motivated Izare Webe to pursue a PhD in evolutionary psychology at Oakland University. I wanted to look into, first of all, what explains why people are prone to believing these things in the first place. Is there a functional, adaptive reason why people might be paranoid and wary of, you know, um, pharma companies or governments. Like so many of us, Cesare's family dynamics can get quite complicated. And this year, an election cycle and the holiday season are back to back. It's almost like a perfect storm in some ways for potential family conflict. But you can, you can have some tools in your tool belt to try to navigate those family gatherings a little bit easier. Dr. Heidi Lyons is a professor of sociology at Oakland University. The data does show that as a country, we're becoming more politically polarized. I don't think that's surprising to anyone. So I think the probability of having a family member who might feel different politically than you do is probably higher because we have such a, a growing diversity in, in political thought. We know the closer it gets to the election season, the more ugly even these ads become and the more ugly the responses of individuals who believe either side um, become. Dr. Rose Moten is a clinical psychologist in Detroit. We always know there's going to be that one relative that gets a kick out of kind of pushing buttons and seeing individuals maybe get uncomfortable by discussing this. She says it's vital to remember understanding where someone is coming from does not necessarily mean you support their beliefs. You can understand why pro-lifers are pro-lifers without agreeing with pro-lifers. You can understand why pro-choice individuals are pro-choice individuals without necessarily having to agree with them. And this is the beauty of kind of using, you know, this, this, this logical brain here and this critical thinking, you know, areas in our brain that allow us to see the differences in opinions. It's kind of like, if this is who my brother is, then what does that make me? You know, and so I think that that makes sense that you want your family who is in some ways a part of you. We think of our family as being an extension of us to be aligned. I mean, that makes sense. Here's what you can do if the family get together this year goes off the rails. So step number one, always remember you can only control yourself, your actions and your reactions. If you feel like maybe one of your family members is saying something dangerous, pull them upside. Don't embarrass them in front of everyone, pull them aside, explain to them why you are concerned about that belief. One of your personal boundaries may be, I don't engage in these conversations if they come up in settings that I don't deem they're appropriate to be had in. The next thing is that we wanna make sure that you're aligning your expectations. You are not going to change anyone's mind in this conversation. So why even expend the energy in this setting of getting yourself upset in an attempt to do so? You are not going to change your mind. You will alienate them further if you just tell them that they're stupid. They're not. Evidence doesn't show that intelligence is related to believe in conspiracy theories. Remember, you don't have to be all things to all people in your life, right? So just because people don't align politically with you, doesn't mean that you can't be a good daughter, son, brother, 
father, right? Just because they're different, choose to, to align on something else. Talk about other things. You don't have to be all things to all people. Dr. Rose suggests a simple breathing technique that you can do at the dining table or in the living room if the dispute becomes heated. Inhale through your nose, holding your breath for about four to five seconds, and then slowly exhale through your mouth, holding your breath again before you inhale. Repeat the exercise three to four times, and experts say it's been proven to help calm your physiological state. The person who doesn't think the same as you do is as passionate about their views as you are. And you don't want to listen with the intent of, I just got to get in there and respond. Listen with an open mind and understand there's always a why behind why a person feels the way they do. As her semester wraps up, PhD candidate Izari Webe says she'll offer more than an olive branch this holiday season. People I don't agree with politically in my family, I now understand where they're coming from more, um, especially during election time. She's armed with education, a deeper knowledge of what motivates people, and how to react. I'm so thrilled because now I, I can actually uh, do my job of understanding human nature and not being shocked and baffled whenever, you know, an election doesn't turn out the way I, I imagine it would be. Switching gears to an issue centuries in the making, gender inequality. Equality advocates say America has a long way to go to ensure women receive equal pay for equal work. In Harris County, Texas, wage disparities are even larger between white men and women of color and among women of various races. According to a University of Houston study, it takes the average Latina an entire year to catch up with the average white man's income. But steps toward solutions and equality are underway. Latina women will have to work through December 8th of this year to make the same wages their white male counterparts earned the year before. That is the disparity that this pay structure um, has created. It's a bias. Yvette Mayo is the founder of Power on Heels Fund Incorporated. The nonprofit advocates against gender pay gap for Latinas and women of color. Well, Latinas are at the bottom of the pay scale. Hispanic women in Harris County are making 37 cents to the dollar compared to white male earners. Black women make 45 cents. Asian women were paid 62 cents and white women earned 70 cents. Race, ethnicity and gender. So women of color are going to feel the weight of both of those. Elizabeth Gregory calls that the double gap. Gregory is the director of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Program at the University of Houston. Her department has been researching the gender pay gap in Harris County and wage inequality for several years. And it may be connected to uh, the signature industry of the area, which is oil and gas, which is heavily white male employees at the upper ranks. Nationally, the data shows the gender wage gap shrunk slightly from 20 percent down to 19, while in Harris County, it jumped from 17 percent to 20. In addition to low wages, the study also looked at the impact that the county's poverty rate and other factors contributed to widening the gender wage gap. Then there are issues around things like who's taking care of children. Mayo says the negative economic impact can affect multiple generations. Hispanic women um, um, support on average three generations, herself, her family, and her parents. And if she's making less money than everyone else, then that's, there's less money for her. As a way to create a solution, Power on Heels offers a free training annually. We create greater awareness to what gender pay gap inequity is, where the deficiencies are, but most importantly, how she can become her best advocate. High school students and professional women can then apply for a scholarship. I finally found my hope. 
Dr. Angela Gala Gonzalez, who is now a transformational health coach, was awarded the first scholarship in 2019. It helped her to get certification to transition from an employee to business owner. Power on health was a source of uh, empowerment. The Afro-Latina says it will take the voices of other women to continue the fight for equal pay. Stand up within the gap and just make sure that you close it. Experts say there's more work to be done to close the wage gap, but a part of the solution could be in changing the culture about the way we talk about wages. Historically, we've had a lot of rules against people asking, like, what's your pays? And you could even be fired for asking someone else what their pay was. Try to undo that. On January 1, a new law goes into effect in California aimed to alleviate sex wage disparities. The bill will require private employers with 100 or more employees to submit pay data, reports including the average hourly rate for each combination of race, ethnicity and sex. It also requires employers with more than 15 workers to publicly share the pay scale in any third party job posting. And it could also open up employers to civil litigations. Keeping schools safe. A nationwide issue, an important topic that needs solutions. We're giving them what they need to succeed and go home safe. When we come back, lessons of the past have given a Virginia campus a safety blueprint. More solutions in just a moment. The happiest moments. The heroes who inspire. Something good is happening here. Search for Something Good Show on YouTube and subscribe to the channel. Something Good, the good news you need. Welcome back. A $13 million security upgrade is coming to the Virginia Military Institute. That's just one of the many ways they stand out when it comes to protecting cadets and staff compared to college campuses. So what exactly is working? What practices and methods can become solutions for other police departments across the country? We head to Virginia to find out. We train for active shooter training once a month. We have to pressure test our officers. Let's put them under some serious pressure to see if they can respond to these calls. There's two basic expectations of campus law enforcement, and that is to provide a safe environment and keep them out of harm's way. Are you doing more training than a typical college campus would? I would say, I would say absolutely. We have to pressure test our officers. Let's put them under some serious pressure. Every call is the unknown. We got to come to work. We got to be ready, expecting the worst and hope for the best. A $13 million security upgrade. Mm -hmm. Do college campuses get that? Typically not. It's very unique here in Virginia. We're the only school that has this security feature. It'll never happen here. I've heard those comments in my career, my 34 year career, I've heard people say, it'll never happen here, and things happen. My name is Mike Marshall, I'm the Chief of Police for the Virginia Military Institute. How many cadets, students, go here? We average per year 1,700 cadets stay in these barracks. It's not like your traditional college where they get to live off, off campus. Uh, they're here the entire time, they're cadetship. VMI is unique in the type of VIP visitors that you get. Who all has come here? We've had several presidents, several vice presidents. Recently, Vice President Pence was here. We have Secretary of the Army, Secretary of the Navy, Air Force. This could very well be a target at any time. It could be, and, and that's why we have to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Talk to me about where we're sitting. Today we're sitting in what we call the Emergency Operations Center. It's a location that has been established when we have to address critical situations that occur on post or could possibly be adjacent to our post. When I refer to posts, it's our campus. 
And this is not just for emergencies. You use this all the time so that you can be prepared in case of an emergency. Yes, we, we stand up when we have any type of incident or sporting event that we call a large mass where people can gather more than typically a thousand and we stand it up due to the risk factors. When parents send their students here to VMI, they're entrusting you. Yes. And how seriously do you take that job? I truly am confident that they believe that there's two basic expectations of campus law enforcement, and that is to protect their kids, provide a safe environment, and keep them out of harm's way. We train for active shooter training once a month. We have a, an active shooter committee. And it's chaired by the captain of the police department and uh, two other individuals that are in lead roles that is part of our special emergency response team. And what they do is they, they sit down and they lay out the training for the year on how we're going to address the needs of our community and what are the trends that we're seeing. And then after the, the training, they look at our policies. They review our policies. Are we in compliance? Do we need to make changes? And then the, the actual drill takes place twice a year. And so they train for six months, then they have to partake in a drill. That's where they come to this EOC, <laughs> they get the scenario. A report of an active shooter on location. They respond and then we test them. And what we do is we put them up under what we call the pressure test. Your hands up, we want to put the hardest conditions in front of them. Because if they're going to make a mistake, we want them to make it in training, not the day or the evening when they're responding to that high risk call. We have to be more proactive in our training and, and also we have to pressure test our officers. Let's put them under some serious pressure to see if they can respond to these calls. Also part of that training is equipment. We make sure we have all the latest and greatest tools that are out there. What we have here is a breaching kit, which includes the RAM. So if a door is locked, barricaded in, we can use the RAM. If someone has taken a chain and locked the door, then we have a bolt cutters. It's called a soft shield, so it gives them extra protection. It's uh, called a night angel. And what it does is you can throw it down the hallway and light up the hall so you see, so that gives you the upper hand. And then each vehicle does have a drop down for their rifle. They also have a shotgun. So what's the importance of having all of these tools in every single police car? Um, that way we're always prepared. If uh, an officer gets to a scene and he doesn't have what he needs, then we're putting him at a disadvantage. So, in that, so with every car being equipped with this, when they get to the car, they know they have, we're giving them what they need to succeed and go home safe is what our goal is. And you build up those tools by studying what has happened in other situations? Yes, it, it started from the Virginia Tech shooting. We did a self audit ourselves of the police department based off of some of the situations that law enforcement encountered that day. And we decided, how can we make it better? We've got to do something to remember the people that paid the ultimate sacrifice that day. You know, they gave their life. And let's, let's do something proactive instead of reactive. And so our mindset here is proactive, proactive, proactive. I call it the three Ps. <laughs> Let's talk about Uvalde real quick because yeah. this was important for you to sit down with me because you wanted people to know that law enforcement can and should do better. Yes. Talk to me about that. Law enforcement, when you don this badge, you take on a certain amount of risk. And that day we, we saw the risk factor was there. You're going to resort to your training. And uh, there's two simple factors when I evaluated, I spent the entire day on a Saturday watching this event unfold and the constant news coverage. That's my role as a police chief. What can we do to make things safer in our community? And, and what I saw that day, I was not there. Um, but what I can evaluate, I've, I've had over 20 years experience training people in active shooter situations. 
And what I saw was you either had people did not receive the training or they did receive the training and they did not follow the training protocols. Are you doing more training than a typical college campus would? I would say, I would say absolutely. I would say a lot of uh, CERT teams aren't, aren't training once a month. I would say that we put ourselves in a good situation to succeed. With the way the world is today, do you wake up and come to work and think this could be the day? Um, I would have to say, as in being a law enforcement officer, we have to. Um, that's sort of our job. Um, of course, we hope that that doesn't happen, but we're also doing the people that we try to protect on campus a disservice if we're not ready for that call. The project will start here, and what will happen is we will have bollards that are mechanical that will come up out of the ground. So if we have a critical incident and we need to shut the post down immediately at our main entrances, this will be one that will have the mechanical bollards that will rise up out of the ground and stop people from coming on the post. What is the reaction from other campus police chiefs when they hear of a $13 million security upgrade? One said, how did you pull that off, Mike? <laughs> and, and what I shared with it, it's, a, it's an initiative that we all should be looking at, looking at in, in this profession. A, a life is priceless. The inner loop provides a different level of security that, that we have to focus on, and that's the movement of the core cadets on a daily basis. So how do we protect this roadway uh, so cars cannot travel down when our core is lining up in front of the barracks for formations? So this will help us alleviate putting personnel. We can put the, the mechanical bollards in place. We'll be able to activate them from a, a phone. What we're looking at for is access control. Can we lock the buildings down? Cameras so we can watch the person, as well as protection in the rooms where mass notification can be sent. So we're here at the barracks. This is where the cadets live. Is this the most protected building on campus? Yes. Yeah? Oh, yes. We start with a security plan that starts on the outside, and it works its way all the way to the each cadet room where we have safety features embedded in that plan throughout. And so on the outside, what kind of security features are we looking at? We're looking at cameras on the outside that are viewed from our police department. And then we have cameras on the archways. Our cadets, they have a guard room. The cadets can view the camera footage, live feed on all the archways. So there are extra set of eyes and ears. So if they see something coming in the archway that's suspicious, they can call 911. At each archway, we have gates that we can lock down manually. So you definitely don't have a guard team on other college campuses watching over where students live. No, ma'am, you do not. And they're responsible for the individuals that are, are moving around, making sure that the, the, the barracks are safe for our core cadets. How proud are you of the work that your team does? It's priceless. And, and that's one, one big word, it's priceless. They, they, the initiative and drive to make sure that these young cadets here can succeed. These are our future leaders, not only in the military, but leading corporations. These are people you're gonna see one day sitting at the table as a CEO, CFO, and, and be able to make this place a safe environment for them to achieve that standard. It's a big burden to carry on the police officer's shoulders. I couldn't be more proud of them. They make VMI here. I work for them. <laughs> the VMI police chief is also putting together a best practices document for all college campuses to use. In addition, the annual security report for VMI is more than 200 pages. You can find it on their website, vmi.edu. Sexually transmitted disease numbers have spiked in certain areas of the country. Certain diseases, like syphilis, are at levels that haven't been seen since the 1950s. We can prevent and we can treat and we can manage. And treatment is prevention. So what now? What solutions exist? We try to do as much outreach as we possibly can with the limited staff that we have. Important answers coming up.
Welcome back. Let's talk about health. More specifically, sexually transmitted diseases, or STDs. The CDC reported a spike in the number of STD carriers with over 2 million cases in 2021. And get this, the number of congenital syphilis cases rose more than 200% over the last five years. Officials and experts have made it their mission to reverse momentum by figuring out ways to shatter the stigma and stop the spread. I have a passion for health and I have a passion for people. I want to be a, um, an avenue to provide information. As a public health person, um, this mission is exactly where I am and who I am. It's not just a job for these health experts, but a purpose, treating, preventing, and educating people about sexually transmitted diseases. New preliminary numbers for the CDC show an alarming spike around the country. As someone who's so passionate, this is near and dear to your heart. What is your reaction when you hear that? It's frustration because we can prevent and we can treat and we can manage. And treatment is prevention because if you're not treated, then you're continuing to spread it and giving it to somebody else. There's still a lot of stigma. There's a lot of fear about coming for testing. People don't like to come in and tell you about what's going on in their, their personal lives. Most people know that safe is a safe place to come and that you can come here and talk honestly and get good, good information and support. You know, we started as a hospice. Basically in 1986, people were dying of AIDS. They didn't survive. So it was a place to provide safe, comforting care to people that had HIV and often didn't have families to support them. As medication changed, evolution of HIV changed, uh, people are living with HIV rather than dying of AIDS, we transitioned our care to become more outpatient focused. We don't have a nursing home anymore. Instead, we provide wraparound services Every opportunity that we can to talk about it and normalize it makes a difference. So we're doing focus groups with parents, with uh, care providers, to really just normalize the conversation so people know that they should come to us. We're trying to reach out into different community groups, um, but it's, it's hard because people are still afraid to talk about it. And the conversation is not just happening in metropolitan areas. Community Action Inc. of Central Texas has a similar mission, but with a focus on outreach in rural areas. Outreach is to, uh, to be able to reach those communities that really need our services, especially the rural areas that don't have access to internet or um, they don't have access to transportation. We've been around for a very long time and we have built the trust with the rural community. We go to the university quite frequently. We go to um, health fairs, local health fairs, any place that will invite us, we go. We send people, we give out information. We try to do as much outreach as we possibly can with the limited staff that we have. Despite the challenges, Belver says their mission and conversation will continue. Sometimes we have to fight a little harder to get some of the, the uh, support that we need, but uh, we're, we are there and our clients need us each and every day. I don't think anybody has all the answers, but you know, together we can look and try to find those answers together and work out the best thing for everyone involved. Thank you so much for watching. While this might be the end of the show, the discussion is just beginning. We have a lot more solutions to many different topics on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash solutionaries. If you know of creative problem solvers in your community, we want to hear about them. Or you just drop us a note and tell us how we're doing. Leave us a comment and subscribe and share. Sharing solutions helps everyone. Thanks for watching. Until next time, I'm Lewis Bolden.